Yeah. Okay, we're here with Luke Lemon from Muscle Nerves for the Travis Jones Show, and today we are talking everything from waist trainers to uh, <laughs> transformations to um, the fitness industry, the state of the fitness industry. Man, thank you so much for being here today. Hey, man, thanks for having me. So, Luke's been in the industry a long time. Um, how long have you been in the industry for? I'm a bit of a dinosaur. Yeah. Um, you know, it depends on how far you want to go back. I mean, I started lifting weights when I was about seven or eight years old and started competing in powerlifting when I was 14, then got into bodybuilding when I went to college, and I've just kind of never stopped. So, I've been all over the place. Because I think, like, for us, uh, being in the industry, if you've been in it for longer, like, I think I've been, like, 16 years now. It's not as long as probably yourself or as long as other people, but I think the amount of time I've been in the industry, I've seen a lot of evolutions. And you see some stuff that was in the past has come back again, like from Paul Check focusing on breathing to now all of a sudden everyone's focusing on fucking breathing. Yeah. Um, it's like um, the 70s have come back um, and we're into flares. So, like, today I really want to get to your insights into transformations i really want to get your insights into you know like what people need to be focusing mm. on their transformations um like i guess the biggest thing what made you start in the fitness industry uh, you know what? I, I've got a little bit different story than everyone else. And, and it's the same story as, you know, a few really weirdo trainers in the industry. I mean, I, I got into the industry because I've just always done this. It's all I've known, you know, starting off, you know, lifting weights because you looked up to Arnold Schwarzenegger when you were a kid and then lifting weights for Texas football and then going into powerlifting and bodybuilding. It's basically all I've known since I've been a little kid. And in college, I, I went to college to be a computer programmer because I was also a big time into tech and computers started programming computers. And I was a little kid too. And then I got into college and went, man, I just can't do this. I can't, I can't, I don't want to get a computer science degree and work with the type of guys that are in this industry because like I was trying to fit a square peg into a round hole and I said, I'm never going to be happy doing this. So I eventually left and instead of going to college for everything, I just, I said, okay, who's the best at this? Who's the best strength and conditioning coach in the world? And at the time, you know, it was Charles Poliquin or it was also Paul check or it was all these other guys. So I ran the gamut of going and seeing these guys. And then if I wanted to learn something from, I want to learn about diabetes, I'd find the best doctor. I'd go see that person. And I just kind of went from one person to another, um, just spending all my college money money on doing internships and, um, and yeah. And then, you know, I, I decided to finally just do it and jump into it in my early twenties. And I started training people at that point. And then I was selected to start teaching people with Polka group. And I started doing that for a little over 10 years and left them and now started muscle nerds. So you were the Polka group for a long time. Yeah. Um, now for yourself, like educating, uh, like I always tell anyone who can get to one of your seminars to go because you're actually a great presenter. Um, but I feel like, um, one, because you're a little bit more candid and, and you don't mind telling people to fuck off, but yeah. at the same time, yeah. you, um, you have been presenting for a long time. And I think uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about the 10,000 hour, right? Like, mm. Because you were presenting so long with the Polkan group, you are such a good presenter now. Do you think that's helped you format your style in presenting? Or Yeah, I think so, because it's you, you get thrown into things, right? And mine was a little bit of kind of mentorship of sitting in on countless hours watching Charles lecture and watching other people lecture for Pollock Group and then eventually just like here you're going to present now you're, you either sink or swim and having to learn how to do it and then create my own style because I had no training in it. I'd never done public speaking. I was terrified of public speaking. And I actually had to take, when I was in college, I had to take public speaking three or four times because I would, right before I had to do a speech, I would just stop the class. And I finally ended up with a, a really good teacher for speech uh, 1301 that allowed us to do whatever we wanted to do. She goes, look, you need to speak to your personality. And I'm kind of a practical joker and I'm a bit brass, brash and I'm a bit rude. And I'm like, okay, so I just stood up there and told jokes and cussed and just was me. Yeah. And I was like, wow, this is actually not as bad as I thought when I can actually do it on my terms and not have to do it the way people think you should lecture. Yeah. Right. So, and that's like the first couple of slides in, in my presentations that for people who've never heard me talk, I'm like, look, I'm probably going to insult and offend every single person in this class. Let's not be little pussies. It's just only good fun. I'm going to cuss. I'm going to say misogynistic things. I'm going to say all these really crazy things that you don't think people should say because it's funny. 
and I don't mean any harm by it. And I think the more we the more we talk about these uh, these uh, situations with people, the less power it has over them. So we can take away all of these political correcting this stigma bullshit and just be fun and be ourselves and go back to being human again. Yeah, like I guess for you when you're um, doing your seminars, some of the content can be drop. I'm yeah, um, but I guess yeah. the more engaging you are with how you present it is how people remember it. And I think that's one of the biggest things you do when you actually lecture because you're lecturing an engaging um, way of biochemistry. Yeah, people actually, uh, you know, remember it for once in life because they've probably been taught it three or four times in the past and they remember nothing. A hundred percent. And the the more you can tell stories, people are going to remember stories. People aren't going to remember a lot of facts. If you just spit out facts and you're super dry, they're going to lose focus. They're going to fall asleep. How do you lecture intensely for eight to 10 hours and no one falls asleep and everybody's having a good time? Well, you got, you have to be a maniac. You got to get out there and act like you just reeled off a big old line of crystal and just fucking go, you know? And that's because I, 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 I lecture really hard. Like yeah. I'm kind of the opposite. They tell you to do less slides and teach less, but teach it better. I just, I would rather teach a lot and teach it better and give them a lot of things to think about. So when they come back to class again, now they understand the stuff a little more and they've been able to go home and they've got the thirst for knowledge and they want to find the answers for themselves. I don't believe in just giving people answers. I want to show you where to find the answers. I don't want you to work on it and work hard and then come back and talk to me again with better questions and more in depth questions. And let's just keep unraveling all of this stuff and find out, you know, why are your clients fucked up? Because they're going to be fucked up for a lot of different reasons, right? If you have somebody who's just sedentary, doesn't move, overeats, that's very simple. Clean up their diet and then get them moving more. There's nothing magical about that. But what about these people who have done rapid transformations or they've done, you get a, a soccer mom, she's 38, she's got three kids, she's also got a job and she doesn't sleep and she doesn't take care of herself and she's chronically stressed out over time and she doesn't eat enough calories to fuel her workouts and now her metabolism is completely fucking wrecked. How do we get that person back to living optimally and thriving, not just surviving off very little calories? and very little sleep and, and you know, over-exercising. Do you think that's one of the main things or main reasons you started Muscle Nerds? Because it's not just, it is, you know, thermodynamics, calories in, calories out, but at the end of the day, it's not. It's actually helping people have a thriving yeah. life and a surviving life. Yeah, and it's, you know, when I was at Group, we were teaching people how to train Olympic athletes, yeah. right? And I got 10 years of teaching this stuff, and I'm thinking – I ask everyone in the class, what is your demographic? And no one trained athletes. It was all gen pop. So you're going to go home and you're going to give Susie Muffin Top these programs that we've learned to train Olympic athletes. And yeah, it might work for some, but it's going to work for like 25, 30% of your clients. You're going to fail 70% of them. Yeah. Right. And you're never going to be able to build a big business like that. So I thought, man, what is nobody teaching? Well, nobody's teaching how to train normal people. Like Joe Dingleberry from next door comes to you. How the fuck are you going to, you're not going to give him Milo Sarsev giant sets and a fucking zero carb diet for five years. And some people can, can legit go through that. If you're training, if your demographics, teenagers and 20 year olds, that's fine. But you know, I've been training for over 30 years and I can tell you what I used to do in my early twenties. I'm 41 now. I can't do that anymore. Like I don't, A, I don't have time. I don't have desire. My identity doesn't revolve around my, 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 the way I look anymore. Like I don't have to be in my twenties. I had to be the biggest, strongest, baddest motherfucker in the room. And when I turned 35, 36 and I realized if I keep training like this stuff starts falling apart, I have to learn how to modify this. And I went, fuck man, no one's teaching people how to train normal people. And 99.98% of the industry is just normal schmucks from next door. And we have to, we have to restructure the way we think about program design and, and think about real life because they don't have time to train seven days a week, twice Twice a day doing super compensation. You know, they want to be able to have go to parties and eat without guilt, you know, and, and most of them want to sleep better, poop better, feel better, think better, have energy and not be in pain anymore. Yeah, exactly. I guess when most people have more energy at the end of the day, then they're probably going to eat better and then yeah. everything else falls into, uh, into place. So, and, you know, for you, you know, you have at least more rest base mode, mm. I guess, and that's when um, all the people know you about that. Yes. Yeah. So do you want to go into that a little bit and tell us about what is least mode why do people need to start or some people start in least mode and what is beast mode yeah we'll get there. okay so when, when you think about everything people are doing everyone's beasting life already and most of the time when people come in to see you 
the last thing they need is doing prowler tabatas and fucking drop sets on with fucking weight releases and chains and bands. Like they just simply don't need it. What they need to do is they need to start from the bottom and work their way back up. Um, but I had never saw that happening. Someone would come into a gym and they'd be like, let me give you a few free sessions and show you how bad I can thrash you. And people would, they'd work out and they'd go, Oh, I'm so sore. That was a great workout. But is that actually getting people better? And the answer is probably most of the time, no. People are coming in with high blood pressure. You're not going to fix that by training heavier and training more with weights. Um, you, you're going to fix things like high blood pressure and metabolic disruption by balancing out the way their body partitions nutrients. And yeah, there is a calories and calories out component of this, but we see people all the time that come in that have super high or super low blood pressure, super high or super low resting heart rate. Both of those are bad, fucked up HRV. They're not in any state to even recover from the workouts. When we go in the, to train with weights, what is the primary outcome? To grow muscle and to get stronger. Yeah. Okay, but you're not growing muscle and getting stronger while you're in the gym. You're just providing a stimulus to drive adaptation. And that adaptation comes into 23 hours of the day that they're not in the gym. Well, if someone's chronically stressed out, are they recovering effectively? Probably not. So <clears throat> I started looking at the models of what we use with athletes. And if you train athletes, you'll understand the concept of general physical preparedness versus specific physical preparedness. So if someone comes in, I go, what's your three top goals? I'd like to lose weight. How much weight would you like to lose? Uh, I want to lose 10 kilos. Okay, cool. That gives us a metric we can measure over time. Okay. Um, I want to put 10 kilos on my bench press. I want to, I want to run a faster 5k. Those are all specific goals. Now, if I'm looking at their biometrics and I have a guy that comes in with stage two hypertension, the last thing I want to do is work on that 10 kilos of of bench press, 10 kilos of squat, whatever. I need to get him healthy first. Yeah. So instead of going into a specific phase, why don't we look at the athletic model and say, okay, a lot of our gen pop clients need a GPP phase as well, which means instead of giving them what they want, we're going to give them what they need, which means I'm going to say, okay, all right, Travis, I see here that you have 147 over 91 blood pressure. Your resting heart rate's 85. I see that you're sleeping like four hours a night. You're waking up 800 times to pee. Okay. I'm going to work on fixing this first. It's going to take roughly five to eight weeks, then we'll go into the specific training. And what we find is if we give them that GPP phase, they hit a lot of their goals without actually working on them. Yeah. Okay? And they don't realize how, how horrible they feel because they've spent years feeling so horrible that that's their normal. Mm -hmm. Then we get people that come in again, like the 38 year old soccer mom, she comes in, she's gone through a few transformations. She looks great for a couple of days. They blow up. They look great through the second transformation for a couple of days. Then they blow up. Then they get to a point after three or four of these where they're like, fuck, I, I have to eat 800 calories to maintain my weight. Okay, cool. Now, you, you talk to a lot of people in the industry and they go, well, if you're eating 800 calories, you're not losing weight. You're not still not in the calorie deficit. Okay. Where the fuck do you draw the line? Like, do we put them on 400 calories now to get them to their goal? Do we give them zero calories? Do we make them do a Jesus 40 days and 40 nights fast? Do you just keep cranking up their output? Like you could do that, but at what point do you say, okay, this person is suffering. They're not eating anything. And when they do, they binge. So they go, you know, they'll go they'll Monday through Friday when they've got structure during the work week, they do really well. Maybe they're eating like 1200 calories a day. And then on the weekend, the fucking wheels come off. So if you wash, rinse and repeat that over time, you're never going to fix their metabolic rate. And that they're right on the calories in calories out thing. They aren't in a calorie deficit because their new normal calories are like 800 calories. Yeah. So then if they, if they blow out on the weekends and they eat three or 4,000 calories on a Saturday and a Sunday, well, they've jack their metabolic rate during the week. It's now low. Now they're going to binge. So they're more likely to put on more fat. Then they go back to that Monday and they start starving themselves again, Monday through Friday. Then they blow out on the weekends and they keep doing this over time. They're never going to fix any of this stuff. And they're just going to keep putting on weight, putting on weight, putting on weight. So you look at somebody that does this over four years, they've put on 10 or 15 kilos. It doesn't want to come off yeah. and they're, they don't know what to do because they're, they're convinced they're not eating anything. And they're right. Most of the time they're not eating enough because their body doesn't want it anymore. So what do we do? Do we reverse diet them out of it? That's okay. We could do that. Or do we just crank their, do we crank their calories back up and then take care of their physiology and get their body calmed down so that their body works correctly again?
So with this, I guess that's one of the biggest things people talk about, right? Reverse dieting over you know 12, 16, 20 weeks, right? Yeah. Slowly increasing calories, um, or just like you know you're currently eating twelve hundred, you know here's twenty two hundred. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Like, what's your thoughts? So I've got a you know I've got a few different things. So I I I'm not a reverse dieting guy. I don't I don't care for it. When you look at total daily energy expenditure, if somebody has a really high output. You've got a lot, a lot of wiggle room to add calories back where they're not going to gain a lot of weight. And in most cases, I'll see I'll see over the case of four or five months, they might put on three kilos of weight, which is nothing. Yeah. And now they're eating twice as many calories, right? That's great. If I can give them twice as many calories and they only gain three kilos, cool. Once they stabilize, now I've created a new normal. Now I can make a new calorie deficit. Mm. But they have to be they have to be told that we're playing the long game. We're done with the transformations. You've already fucked yourself up doing those. Let's work on what you're going to look like 12 months from now, which means you might have to gain a small amount of weight for a few months. We need to stabilize for a few months. Now we can put you in a, into a rapid transformation when your calories and your work output is really high, you're sleeping well, and all your biometrics look good. So we look at this over like a lease mode to beast mode continuum where on that GPP lease mode side, they might spend you know two or three months getting their health back in order, getting their workout put up, getting their food up. Now we stabilize and we start sliding into that specific phase. So we start sliding towards the beast mode side and we slowly turn the volume up, slowly turn the intensity up. And now we can create a calorie deficit when they're in a good position for it. Because most people that come in for a transformation, they're not in any position to do this and people aren't being pre-qualified, yeah. right? And then we can also utilize lease mode during their training, during the entire, uh, 12, like a 12 month prep. If you see those biometrics start to crumble and they're trending in the wrong direction for say five, six, seven days, all right, cool. I can throw a lease mode week in there, let them recover and then start beasting them out again. So we can start using like kind of like an alternating periodization. Yeah. So normally you see alternating periodization, what Polican group pretty much, um, you know, their, their whole shtick was alternating intensification phases. So why don't we think about lease mode and beast mode phases? So I'm going to beast you until your metrics get bad. Now I'm going to throw in a small block of lease mode stuff to get the metrics good again. And then I'm just going to wash, rinse, and repeat that over time. And you can keep people from getting to the point where they're having to starve themselves to try to get to, to lean levels. Do you think this happens with coaches training themselves? Like, Is that one of some of the worst people you see? Or? Uh, well, okay. Trainers live a really weird life, right? So if you look at most of the trainers, you've got trainers who are single. They live in a gym. They never go home, right? They can sleep when they want. They can, they, they can, they can make their own schedule. They live a fantasy life that the average person doesn't live. Mm. If I'm training a woman with three kids and her, maybe her partner works 80 hours a week, maybe she works 50, 60 hours a week. And plus she's taking care of the kids and he's doing what he can. And you know, it's a, it's a weird infrastructure, but that's life, right? And now you get a 21 year old trainer who all he cares about is the way he looks. So he thinks everybody should look like that. Yeah. His what he in his mind what the client wants is not what they're actually telling him, and he's like, "You're gonna have to do fourteen thousand steps a day. That's two and a half hours of fucking walking. Then I also need you to cut cut down to a fifty percent calorie deficit, even though you're already fucking tired and you're not sleeping. Fuck sleep. You need you need to prioritize getting an hour of cardio in, two and a half hours of walking, and an hour of weight training. I need you to meal prep two hours a day, and then you know what? Fuck it. Just quit your job so that you can just train, eat, and sleep, and have some time for." your kids and your partner and yourself and just be broke and be broke <laughs> that's it fuck it and it's 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 crazy to me because it's just a fantasy land they're not they're not being realistic to what gin pop needs mm. now if you're a physique athlete great like go out and walk 25,000 steps a day because your priority is the way you look. That's fine. Do you think this happens with, I'm not saying like a Polygon group because I actually, I, you know, back in the day, 2005 is when I first did my yeah. thing and all that sort of stuff. Like I actually learned so much from Charles, but I found um, a lot of the Polygon group, the reason why they get a lot of great results is the head trainers in the Polygon area or in the cities, a lot, a lot of coaches went to them. So not actually coaching Gen Pop, they're coaching coaches who have the time yeah um do the steps do the uh, you know double day training and all of a sudden they're like oh i've got these great transformations with all these supplements and all these programs yeah. and they work and then the coaches who were getting coached by them then try to then go and start training you know susie muffin top the same way and then they're just literally breaking people yeah is that what you've seen sometimes? well yeah and that's the thing like there Polica group was teaching a lot of really good things if it was put in a context of what the demographic was, we were teaching you how to train, right? 
And, and then, yeah, we were teaching to take, okay, if you've got all these problems, let's chase your problems with pills. And so then you've got people on 500 pill, $2,000 a month protocols that you're just chasing fatigue and you're trying to self-medicate it instead of saying, okay, instead of doing this, why don't we restructure your lifestyle first? And then we'll just throw in the supplements you actually need. So I hardly give anybody supplements anymore. Yeah. Just a basic multivitamin, multimineral. We'll give someone fish oil if they don't eat a lot of seafood. We'll give them some creatine. And anything above and beyond that is going to be specific to what's happening. A melatonin if they're not sleeping, Finibut, which you can't get anymore. I mean, you can, but you're not supposed to. Like, um, you know, there's a lot of th supplementation needs to be specific for what they need. And you need to understand biochemistry because different supplements are going to drive different things. And some things don't play well together. And sometimes you have overlap and they can drive things too fast or slow things down. So there's a lot to it, but in, in all respects and regards, it should be lifestyle first. So we have to focus on that first. And for a lot of our clients, a lot of the gen pop people, that's the main hammers, the lifestyle stuff that they're not taking care of because they don't think it's as important. Not just the coaches. I mean, the, the, the actual client, you can get a client that'll come in five days a week and thrash themselves, but they won't spend five hours a week doing recovery stuff at work and trying to sleep another hour and that type of thing. But I, I think part of it is that coaches don't understand enough, um, enough physiology. Yeah. They only understand methods and good coaches will understand methods and principles, but very few uh, coaches understand methods, principles, and the, the physiology. And if you understand the physio physiology, you'll go, okay, what method and what principle is going to work best right now? And where do we need to go to later? Because it, everyone's getting hammers. So they're just hitting things. They're playing whack-a-mole. They're like whack-a-mole, whack-a-mole, whack-a-mole. They're just running around whacking things with their hammers when a screwdriver might be a better tool for this person right now. Yeah. What about um, when we're looking at this, do you think everyone should be tracking HRV then? Like, you know what? I, I think, I think for a while, that's a good idea. You, we give a, I mean, we give like 20 different tools in our foundations course and yeah. Your clients aren't going to use all of them. They might not use any of them. So you need, I love, I like having data, right? So I, I like, you need some objective data. So if you, the bare basic objective data that most people get is their scale weight. Okay. But that's not going to tell you a whole story. Yep. So like, if you look at the difference between that, in my experience, the difference between men and women, women will look at weight loss strictly by the scale and men look at weight gain strictly by the scale. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's only one metric. So we can get that. We can get pictures as well. Um, we can get circumference measurements. That's easy. It's not technical. People can learn how to do that. If you're really good, if you've done like the ISAT course and you know how to take uh, skin folds correctly, we can get skin folds and use that. We can use the cell phone. We can get a cell phone. We can use instant heart rate. I can, that's easy, non-invasive. They can get a heart rate and I can track the heart rate. Um, if your client has high blood pressure, we can get their blood pressure. And I I'm actually stunned at how many coaches don't take their client's blood pressure. And I think that is crazy. I think if your client comes in, like the first time they come in, we should probably get a, a resting heart rate and a blood pressure. Cause you, if your client's not going to do things at home, you want to control variables where the, you can have them under control. So to have a really good blood pressure monitor, an electronic one that all you have to do is put it on and push a button. You don't have to be trained how to use that. And if your client comes in, you can take that once a week. If their blood pressure has been tr trending really good for a while. Yeah. Just take it every few weeks. No big deal. Their heart rate, take it every few weeks. Once all that stuff's stabled, then you don't have to take it all the time. You don't want to get obsessive about that stuff. But let's say you come in and you've got stage two hypertension and your resting heart rate's 85. Okay. I'm probably going to want to measure that often to make sure that the, the methods that I've picked are driving you in the right direction. Once you get that pretty stable, all right, maybe we go once every, a week and then you start getting an idea of how far I can push somebody before their metrics start to crumble. Now we move to maybe once every three or four weeks and your clients will get to a point if we educate them, because that's what we should be doing. We should be teaching our clients how to be sustainable and how to auto-regulate the programming and auto-regulate the food. It makes your job as a coach a lot easier and it gives them more empowerment and responsibility. So if I have somebody tracking, they're going to know, they're going to wake up one day and be like, I don't feel right. And they're going to automatically take their heart rate, maybe take their HRV and maybe take their blood pressure. And they go, okay, they're going to call me and say, Luke, you know, something's not right. Maybe if they're taking fasting blood sugar, my fasting blood sugar has gone up a little bit. All right, cool. Thank you for telling me. Let's, let's reevaluate what we're doing. We might need to do something different for a couple of weeks and get all this stuff in order. And then we'll go back to pushing you. But the, the key is to give the client responsibility and ownership so that they're giving you the right feedback 
without the right feedback and without the right data, you, you're just basically throwing shit at the wall to see what sticks. Uh, what do you think about this? Like, uh, I guess, uh, again, it's trying to grade that. Like, when people first come in, right, people can only remember four to seven new things. And all of a sudden, you're saying, track blood pressure, take track yep. heart rate, track your HIV, start doing yep. resting glucose. Like, what would you say when, like, when looking at Gen Pop, because a lot of people watching this, they'll be training Gen Pop. What are the first, like, three things you would tell them to start tracking that's super easy for their clients to track and they get buy in? Um, I think yeah. it's a big thing. You need buy in from your clients because then they start feeling better and they're like, okay, now give me another thing to track. Yeah. Now give me another thing to track. And the more buy in someone has, the more that I'll do for you because all of a sudden they can see just these small changes or these small tracking metrics. I understand what I need to be doing moving forward. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> number one, if we want to make this easy, we need to make manuals. Like they need manuals that they can read, that they can reinforce what we're doing. And the very easiest thing they can do. Like I'll, I'll tell you my, my wake, my wake up routine, right? So if the client is willing to get their own blood pressure cuff and all your clients are going to have a smartphone, if they've got money to train, they're going to have a smartphone. So you can wake up and you can put the, the blood pressure cuff on and you can turn on the instant heart rate and you can take your heart, your heart rate through the phone and you take blood pressure within three minutes. You've got two, two readings easy. If they're willing to do HRV, if they're willing to do a chest strap or, um, uh, Bluetooth earpiece or finger piece, now we can get HRV heart rate and blood pressure. Now we've got three things in the first three minutes. Okay. Easy. Um, we can also use, fuck, nobody looks at their poop anymore. Like it's, it, people don't look at their poop. And I think that's really important because yeah. looking at your poop tells you a lot. So we can give them in the manual, we can put the Bristol scale and say, okay, where we need to be is somewhere around four, give or take a little bit. So, you know, everybody's got a poop. So that's a metric where they, you get them realizing I need to look at my poop. Do I see undigested food in my stool? Okay. Now we've got a digestive issue. What's that related to? We can look at things like, am, do I bloat after I eat? You can give them, you educate them over time with stuff like that but it's if i give them one measurement that's going to tell me a lot it'll be that waking heart rate yeah. right so like tell me is like we're looking for the variance in the waking heart rate like are we looking just a high rate waking heart rate? yeah so what we're looking for is we, we say okay i need to give someone a range of a heart rate that they need to be stable at when they wake up in the morning and so when we look into the research it, this new stuff i've been seeing is you want it to be under about 62 62 yeah. beats per minute in the morning right i like it to be in the 50s if possible if somebody's in the 50s they're in pretty decent shape mm -hmm. and then i can look at other things too while we're training where's your lactate threshold if i give you a 12 rep max where do you feel that burning mm -hmm. do you feel it burning at three to four or do you feel it at eight to nine because those are telling me two different things about your metabolism then we can talk about other things that they should be looking for um if you walk up a flight of stairs are your legs on fire because that's common but it's not normal and the more stressed out the more that that becomes a thing um do you have intolerance to light when you go outside do you have to put if it's sunny outside do you have to put sunglasses on because that's going to tell me a lot about your your autonomic tone and if i keep reinforcing this stuff to my clients they're automatically going to come in and be like man the sun's really bright today i didn't really get that a very good sleep this morning i ate breakfast i got really tired after breakfast i saw a lot of undigested food in my stool okay we might be pushing a little bit too hard let's take a few steps back and let's correct these things first and then we'll start pushing you forward again. So when you say, say like take a few steps back, like what do you mean? Like what would you cut volume or cut intensity? Like what would you look at? So it, it, it really depends on what they're doing, right? So the thing, what's going to drive some of these, um, what's going to crumble your metrics the most are going to be things that are going to be stimulating to the sympathetic system. So if I put somebody on say five by fives and aerodyne lactate sprints, okay. If you're, if you're squatting a really heavy set of squats, your body doesn't know you're squatting to make nice quads and to build leg strength. Your body thinks you're wrestling an animal. Okay. Your brain's you, as smart as your brain is. It's, there's still this primal thing where your brain thinks uh, is exists in two modes. Do I feel safe and secure or do I feel threatened? If you pick up a true five rep max and you back that out, your brain's going to go in a, into a stress state, right? If I get somebody and they're doing 15, 15 calorie intervals on the aerodyne, their body thinks they're running from an animal. It doesn't know that they're trying to get more condition. So if I'm looking at their programming and I've got them doing max strength work and they're doing, you know, glycolytic sprints or whatever, I know that at some point they're going, the, the whole point of training is to push you into overreaching. Yeah. I want to see what that overreaching is. So once I see the metrics start to crumble for a few days, I know they're going into that over, overreaching phase. So I've got two choices. I can even either keep pushing them for a while, or I can back off a little bit and allow them to super compensate. So, so 
for me, I don't like cutting volume because you're still giving that, that you're still giving the stimulus. Yeah. So in, in my Pollock training, what we would do is if you're doing say eight sets of three, you would just cut half the sets down. But for me, you're still giving that neural, that neural drive for an athlete that might be okay because an athlete lives to eat, sleep, poop, and train. But for Susie Muffin Top, that's not what she wants. So I would rather say, okay, we've done eight sets of three for the last three weeks. Week four, you're starting to crumble. So week five, we're just going to switch back into maybe a higher, maybe a submaximal hypertrophy phase. Maybe we do GVT 10 by 10. Maybe we go to more muscular endurance. So we start doing some more body weight movement stuff, gymnastic bodies, gold medal bodies, animal flow type stuff. And then we let the body calm down. Two weeks later, all their metrics look better. They feel great. Okay, now let's go back on another max strength phase. So now we can write the periodization of alternating beast mode to least mode type stuff because the, the, at the end of the day we're just trying to get results i mean that's by, at bottom line that's what you're there for you're there to develop somebody long term teach them how this stuff works yeah. and most gen pop how many times have you had somebody come into rbt and go i'd like to squat 300 kilos that's very rare very rare <laughs> and, and i'm a powerlifting coach too i powerlifted nationally for years and years and years so e even myself i probably i have one olympic weightlifter i have one olympic weightlifter we write her nutrition and she's trained by the weightlifter that i train we've got one guy that's a powerlifter and we've got a, a crossfitter going to the crossfit games now we, we've got out of out of a hundred people that we're coaching right now, we might have six people that are performance orientated, and we have ninety four people that just want to feel better and take a solid shit once in a while and, and get six hours of sleep a night. I think that's the population, right? I think we're like three thousand members at the moment, and to three thousand members, we probably have uh, I would say a handful jumping up on stage to compete. Uh, we have maybe one crossfitter that's actually going like pretty decent, but you know, six or seven uh, people actually competing in powerlifting. Yeah, that's out of three. Yeah. For me, it's like, you know, RBT, we, we have our strength phases, we have our conditioning phases, but most people coming to RBT is like, hey, can you get me some abs and can you make me feel better about myself? Yeah. Because uh, I, I, when I turn the, I, I have sex with the lights off because I don't want anyone yeah. to get me. Like, yeah. That's it, right? Well, I haven't been down to the beach for the last three years because I feel like shit taking my shirt off. Yeah. And that's that's who you're literally training. So I think if, if we look at it, it's like, okay, cool, we're not trying to crush people's souls we're just trying to make them feel better about themselves that's right what is the least path of resistance to make someone feel better about themselves 100 percent. and it's not making them it's not punishing them in workouts like that doesn't make them feel good yeah like, where they feel like, like if they come to the session they feel like they failed at training it's probably not a good thing yeah because if you don't have fun when you train and don't enjoy it, then you're probably not going to come back or you're inconsistent. And when you're inconsistent, then you fucking don't get results anyway. Yeah. So like, do you look at that with some of your training as well? It's like, how do I you know, give someone exactly what they need, but how can I make it some form of enjoyment for them inside the training? Like looking at what they enjoy doing with their, with their sessions. Yeah. You know, and that, that's a, that's a, that's a great conversation because people seem to, they seem to look at training as I need to flog myself. If I don't puke during a workout, if I'm not sore for a week, then it wasn't a good workout. And that's, that's not the case. I mean, all we're doing in the gym, all we're doing with lifting, conditioning, if I give somebody supplementation, if I do a specific nutritional protocol, I'm just giving the body a little bit of information to, to tell it how I want it to adapt. And it doesn't mean that giving it more and more intensely is going to push you faster that direction. And in any case, it's probably going to make you crumble a lot faster. So we have to find, I like what Mike Israel talks about with minimum effective dose versus maximal effective dose, right? So we need to find out how far we can push them before they crumble. And then we need to find out how little we can give them to still get results and let them recover. And we need to stay in that zone for a while. And over time, make that shift that zone so that they can handle more and more and more over time. But most people go zero to 100 real quick. They don't actually try to develop their clients. Yeah. And they're too, they're too focused on doing it really fast instead of doing it really correctly. And I, I saw a meme by Lane Norton the other day that I liked. And he said that you know, everyone wants to lose fat really fast. Fast, but if you're not doing it the right way, you're just going to have to do it over and over and over because you're going to you're going to push the body 
to an extreme level to where it's going to push back in an extreme manner. So you do a 12 week transformation and then 24 weeks after that, yeah. you're doing it again because now you're fatter than you were when you started the first transformation. Like, okay, why didn't we just spend 36 weeks doing it right the first time? Let's get it off and keep it off forever yeah. and do it in a sustainable way where people can do it by themselves. Yeah. If your client is getting a, an extreme transformation because you've got them with, you've got five fucking bands on a pendulum squat and you got three fucking coaches screaming at them, they get off the machine and they fall over and then they puke all over the floor. Yeah. Great. You can get somebody where they need to be, but what happens when they try to train them by themselves? Everything that they've been doing to get them there and to maintain it, they can't possibly do on their own. There's no fucking way. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure out a way of how do we get them there where they enjoy their training and they want to train because yeah. I know tons of people they do a they do a transformation and by the time they come to us they go i don't want to train like that anymore it's not fun yeah. like you're right it's not fun let's figure out something that you enjoy doing that will get you where you need to be but again if you only have a hammer and you don't have any other tools then that's the only way you know how to get people lean and that's not going to work for everybody and in most cases going to be detrimental and i had a Years ago, I sat in on a on a lecture by uh, by Dr. Robert Sapolsky, who's like one of the Mac Daddies of stress response, and he did this ninety minute talk about how exercise builds stress resilience, how we need to exercise for this and all that. And one of the guys asked him in the seminar, he goes, "Okay, so Dr. Sapolsky." If exercise is the best form of stress resilience, what's the best form of exercise? And this was, there was 300 guys here and girls, and we were, we were all big meatheads. Like we, at the, at, that was at the time where we thought if you can't fix it with squats or fish oil, you're probably going to die. And he looked at us and he said, you know what? The best form of ex exercise, the exercise people enjoy doing. And at that point I sat there and I went, fuck, what an asshole I was all throughout my early twenties and or all throughout my twenties, and my early thirties, where I made people do things because because I thought that's what they needed. And I also had a revolving, I was just doing lead generation all the time because I couldn't keep long-term clients because no one wants to be thrashed and throw up in the parking lot after they train. And there were a lot of times where I made them do exercises that they hated because I thought they had to do it. I thought everybody had to squat. They don't have to squat. I thought everybody had to do this. I thought that they couldn't do some, if Mary wants to do some ridiculous exercise because her friend Jane's doing it, I wouldn't let her do it because it was something stupid. And I felt like if other trainers saw me letting them do something ridiculous, like an upside down BOSU, BOSU ball squat, I would never at that time have done that because it's stupid. And I still think it's stupid. However, now if somebody asked me if they wanted to do that, I'd be like, you know what? Yeah, I, I probably would as long as they were willing to give me what I wanted in the rest of the workout because now we're doing some negotiation. They're going to have fun. I know that exercise is stupid, but they think there's some inherent value and I'm not going to train to change their belief system surrounding that. I'm just going to make it as safe and as fun as possible because that's going to lower their stress response and allow them to recover and I'm going to get better results. Because mm. it's like, I guess, the environment dictates it. Right. So if they yeah. have a better environment to train in, better environment to eat at home, um, they'll create better habits. Like yeah. I, I love a lot of James Clear. It's probably one of my favorite blogs out there. James Clear, his stuff on habit uh, formation. He wrote a book, Atomic Habits, as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I think if we as personal trainers, coaches, gym owners can help people solidify better habits in their life, I think that's what's actually going to get ultimate long-lasting transformations. And um, you were saying something before, it's like not crush them because then they can't train for the next week. Um, you know, there's a book called Good to Great. And there's so many things that um, are the same in business as the same in a body transformation. They're so, like, relatable. Mm. Um, this Good to Great, he talks about there was um, uh, having a 20 month March in your business so it's like you know you have this sort of threshold where there's an upper threshold and lower threshold so um, when we look at it say sales calls or making sales like I know we tell my guys make one to three sales a day every single day in your business when people try and grow facilities um, don't try and make seven sales don't try and make 15 sales yeah. because if you keep pushing yourself and try and sell for like seven hours a day you're not going to do it tomorrow Yeah. or probably the next day and you burn yourself out it's the same sort of thing right if we have this 20 mile march and they did it from uh, I'll probably bastardize the where they got this 20 mile march from but like I think it was like two like uh, sets of exploring teams went across Antarctica like back in the day and one team walked as far as they possibly could and then they couldn't walk the next day because they fucked themselves and then they walked again as far as they could and then they rested for two days and they actually never made it across and they died whereas another Fuck. team yeah literally another team they just walked 20 miles every fucking day and they made it across yeah. because they just no matter what they just did 20 miles a day and they just got it done they had this threshold they sort of sat within and like it averaged out 
than 20 miles. I think it's like 15 to 25. And I think if we can look at this and like have our own 20 mile march key markets in fitness, like sitting between 19 to 2300 calories or sitting between seven to nine hours of sleep, sitting yeah. like train between five to seven days a week. Like if we have these markers that's like, look, you didn't train fucking seven days this week. You're a fucking loser. Yeah. Um, so then we start to make you feel shit about yourself. Yeah. Whoa. Um, it's like, you're like, fuck this. I fucking hate fitness. You start having this negative self talk in your brain. Yeah. It's like, no, just have a variance where you like you're training four to six days or you're training five to seven days and if you feel like you're fucked up today like you don't have to train yeah like, just because it's on the training schedule i think you know we you know i even say it some days it's like you know you take the athlete's mindset and some of the amateurs mindset and i think some people take it to the wrong way like i say athletes just get the job done amateurs wait for motivation yeah but if you're literally fucked up and you have a if you if fucking sleep was stupid like i didn't wake up this morning i normally wake up at 4 30 every morning and i train that's when i train but I, like i felt sick last night i was like you know i'm just gonna sleep in tomorrow because i know that that's what i need and I'll yeah later in the day if not i'll make it up on one of my rest days later in the week like that's okay it's having the ability to know your body and to know that you don't have to crush your soul every single time every single day of the week just because it's on the schedule yeah um, do you think that's one of the, a big thing that people need to look at or yeah it goes back to what we talked about earlier with auto regulation your client needs to understand like if they if they're feeling pretty crook they don't need to train or maybe we figure out something else to do your client comes in there's nothing that says that you if, if i've got you know heavy squats that day it doesn't there's nothing no rule that says that i have to do that like again your job is results so maybe your client walks in and you can tell your client's having a real fucking bad day maybe their metrics are fucked or maybe you just you're just noticing if they come in and they're just unloading on you all right Today we were going to do, you know, three to one wave loading on squats. You know what? Maybe let's, let's do, let's do some nutritional counseling instead. And maybe let's do some stretching and let's just talk, talk it out and just unload on me, whatever. Let's do some restoration stuff. Yeah. You don't need to lift today. We can do, we can move this to a different day and just shift everything over. That's okay too. Um, because you have, you have what's called controlled transcriptional response to adversity. Again, with your brain thinking, am I in a, in a threatened state or am I in a safe and secure? And that's going to change the way your DNA expresses instructions to the body, right? So there's a chain of command that goes from the sympathetic nervous system and also through the HPA axis that then tells your DNA to transcribe itself in a either positive manner or in a, a high inflammatory, high immune system response. And once you start getting locked in that response, you're not going to be recovering well. So it doesn't make any sense to keep pushing yourself if you're not actually recovering from the, from the workout and then giving people what you said about like the 20 mile March, right? Earlier I said, I wasn't big into reverse dieting, but there are situations where that might be necessary. If I have somebody eating 800 calories and I know their TDEE with all of the exercises they're doing, they need to be eating 2,800 calories. If I just tell them to start eating 2,800 calories and they're not nailing it, they're going to feel like a failure and they're going to feel guilt and that's going to cause stress. That's going to cause an effect in that CTRA. Maybe at that point we say, okay, well, if you can't do this, that's okay. It doesn't make you a bad person. Let's figure out what you can do. So maybe we can eat a thousand calories a day. And once you nail that, now let's eat 1200 calories a day. And once you nail that, so there, there you, you have so many tools that people can use if they understand the physiology and then they understand where to plug and play different types of coaching methods and also nutritional methods methods and also training methods and conditioning me methods and all that. So you say conditioning, like obviously there was a stigma for years in the fitness industry, like cardio is cardio or cardio is oh God. Yeah. Like, tell me about your conditioning, especially like even strength athletes, I guess. Yeah. That's a big thing. So what's, what's your piece on conditioning on cardio? Well, look, it's just a tool. It's a tool like anything else. And, and I was in a seminar in London and somebody called me the aerobics guy. And I go, look, don't call me that. Don't call me that. I'm a former power lifter. I'm a former strength athlete, strong man and all this. I'm, I'm not the cardio guy. I'm the, I'm going to use whatever fucking tool I need at the right time to get the job done. And the reason we spent the first four years at muscle nerds overstating the importance of aerobic exercise, because all this hashtag fuck cardio bullshit mm -hmm. and people saying that, oh, uh, well, blood pressure doesn't matter. If you're a strength athlete, it's normal to have high blood pressure. No, it's not. It's common, but that's not normal. Right. And we know we've got tons of powerlifters that have come through uh, muscle nerds. They've got perfect blood pressure. I'm talking like 115 or 117 over 75. And these guys squat 280 kilos, right? They, they deadlift 300 kilos. Tell me that you have to have that that is a side effect of high level strength conditioning. Um, we've got guys, uh, Will Crozier, 
I mean, he just pulled what, like 387? He pulled 387, and his blood pressure is like, I think it's like 123 over 80, which is damn near perfect. Tell me you have to be unhealthy and that your metrics have to suck to be a high-level, like, world-class champion. You don't. It's because they don't understand physiology. All they understand is lifting heavy and eating big and drugs. That's all they care about. And now you're seeing guys that guys are having strokes. They're ending up in the hospital. They're having issues with their fucking kidneys. And they're like, well, yeah, I'm, a, I'm the picture of health. I'm fine. And then you're like, Bro, your blood pressure is like 160 over 100. You're not okay. Take some time to get that shit in order because it's going to accentuate your lifting. Okay? If we look at basic biochemistry, where do we make the majority of our energy? In the aerobic system. Why would you not want to have that as robust as possible so you can recover harder, not just in between sets, but 24 hours of the day? It just makes more sense. It's it's all about longevity in the sport, too. You know, you don't see a lot of real old world champion powerlifters. Why is that? Yeah, because they're gone. Right? Yeah, they're fucking gone. They can't do it anymore. They're broken down. They can't, they can barely walk. They're taking painkillers just to squat. You know, if they would start taking care of themselves early on and think about, I'd like to have longevity in the sport, they would do the things they need to do to take care of themselves so they can power lift another 10 years without being busted and broken. So with this, obviously body transformations for coaches and personal trainers probably one of the biggest things they have to get their head around. Yeah. How important do you think it is for a trainer to have a good base of actually getting results? Well, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Well, I, 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 <laughs> no, I 100% agree with yeah. you. But I think like for the first, um, I would honestly say for the first six years of me being a PT, like, you know, from years one to, you know, six, I was like, it's a guessing game. I was like, I hope this works. Yeah. Um, and I was like, oh, I bet wish me ever. It's like, I hope this works. It's like, I wasn't really focused on calories. I was more so focusing on paleo clean eating. Yeah. I was focusing on pork and base principles, which is like, let's do some intensification and accumulation. Um, and I wasn't really tracking everything as much as I could. I was just hoping that I would get results. And I really wasn't even selling results. I was just selling two sessions a week. Yeah. And they're like, I'll be like, hey, you're trying to me two sessions a week. Week and I wasn't telling him how long it was going to take to get a result. I'm yeah. just like, no, you're just buying my time as a friend. Twice yeah. A week. Yeah. Um, like, what do you think about you know selling an end result or focusing on like you know, the base principles that coaches need to understand or where should they focus on when they first get into the industry and how to get those transformations? Well, I mean, the thing is. <laughs> Getting as knowledgeable as possible about how the body actually works helps you define what's bullshit and what's not and allows you to make the right decisions on what your clients need to do. And, and understanding, too, like not everybody needs a transformation. Like that's the goal. The end goal is that. But we need to be realistic in how, how quickly can the body lose fat safely yeah. without sacrificing a lot of muscle tissue mm -hmm. and also still having a life. Right. And still having time for your kids and your partner and your job and whatever else you're doing. Um, yeah, it's important. I mean, you, you have to be able to show that you can get results. Yeah. And um, it, we've got a very low barrier to entry uh, this is a career. Like your grandmother could j jump into this industry if she wanted to, never lifting weights in her fucking life. And that's what you see. Like our, the market gets super saturated with people who don't know what the fuck they're doing, but they, they talk a good game because now with Instagram and YouTube and all that, it's not hard to watch someone's video and then immediately make your own video, just regurgitating their information or reading an article and then rewriting your own and just changing a few things and plagiarizing them, but making it look a little different and then making yourself look like an expert and you have no fucking results. Like you have no portfolio. I know plenty. I know people teaching in the industry that have no fucking portfolio. Yeah. And it's like, you've never seen a transformation. You've never seen anything they've done because they don't have any, they went from, you know, maybe they trained for three or four years and they're like, okay, I know what's going on. I'd, I'd like to get into the education realm. So now they're teaching people bullshit. They don't have curriculums. They don't know what they're talking about. And when you ask them the, he's like, well, how does this work? They can't answer that because they don't actually know. They don't have any experience. Like you need, it's same thing with the, the online training. Everyone wants to be an online coach. Everybody, because they think it's easy. If you're doing online coaching easy, it's way fucking harder than in the gym training, yeah. much harder. And, but you know, you don't have to actually have a portfolio to jump into online training, right? People, people just hire you because you have good marketing or because you look good. Yeah, exactly. right? And it's crazy 
crazy because these guys, I, I, I have saw on a forum on Facebook, a guy goes, Hey, how, how important do you think it is for you to be working in a gym for a while before you become an online trainer? You shouldn't be thinking about doing online training until you've got plenty of time under the bar and plenty of time, like looking at people and correcting people and doing an apprenticeship under other coaches and mentorships. You shouldn't even be thinking about that. Like how the fuck are you going to coach somebody over the internet? If you've never coached somebody in person and you've never had any results, it just, it blows my mind. But that's, that's modern day Insta famous Instagram bullshit that we're dealing with right now. But, uh, yeah, fuck that's the first thing I would ask somebody. If, if I went to train with someone as, as a gen pop or as an athlete, I'd be like, let me see your portfolio. Let me see your before and afters. Yeah. Let me see your testimonials and let me see, let me, let me hear that you actually know what you're talking about. And, but then again, not all results are transformations. No. Right. Transformations are sexy. No. It's all about sex appeal. Right. If I put out a, a 20 before and after pictures, people are going to go, that guy knows what he's talking about, but you haven't seen the after the after effects of that. No. If I put up a, a before and after lab, if I run a pathology lab on somebody and go, Hey, look at their cholesterol, look at their triglycerides, look at their CRP, look at all this shit. Look how fucked up they were. Look how we fix this. People are going to go, who gives a shit? Yeah. And Phil Lerney said this a few years ago, health doesn't sell. And I thought about that for a while and I went, you know what? It doesn't sell because no one's trying to sell it. Yeah. And I think that now, because we've been selling this for four or five years now that people are starting to understand that, okay, getting people's health in order is probably more important before we look at getting, you know, six pack abs or whatever. Like, like you said earlier, people, people want to stop dressing in the dark. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You get guys that you get men that want to look down and see their dick because they haven't seen their dick in fucking 10 years because their gut's so big. Like that's fucking real life. You get women that want to wear a size 12 pants that they wore in college that they haven't been able to fit into in 20 years. That's, that's real life, yeah. right? Most of these people don't want to get on stage. I think that's, um, a lot of the reason is, you know, even Simon Sinek says it's like a lot of people are playing the finite game, right? Like the 12 week transformation or the 24 week transformation yeah. instead of going, you know, let's, let's get your health on track and everything will start to fall in place yeah. and selling health and selling a better quality life. Um, while you might not be able to market that on the front end sometimes, but you can definitely market on the back end, but it comes down to education. So yeah. if you can, you know, clarity precedes change. If you can actually have a proper conversation with your client when they first come in and go, you know, this is where your blood pressure is. Yeah. You know, this is where your resting heart rate is. Like this is where you're actually sitting at when we're looking at your body and your, uh, your essentially your markers. And this is where you're like, it's, it's not a good place. And yeah. you keep going down this road like you know your longevity is not going to be there um, yeah. your energy is going to keep decreasing your stress is going to keep increasing and what happens when your stress increases you probably fucking snap at your wife more often you probably snap at your kids and then you probably end up getting divorced and you fucking yeah. shoot fucking life 100 so, like, the more energy we can actually give you means you can have a better quality life which then means you can have better quality relationships which then you probably have a better quality relationship with yourself and then the fat fucking falls off anyway yeah because you don't fucking self-loathe or self-medicate with food and alcohol because that's what people are really doing they're stressed out of their fucking minds they don't know how to handle stress so they self-medicate with you know drugs and alcohol and food being you know the other drug that they have yeah and that's why they look like shit and that's why they fucking feel like shit yeah absolutely Absolutely. Absolutely. But that's a conversation that trainers don't want to have a talk about. They just want to talk about if you just eat less and do more, you'll get there. And then you get to a point where you can't possibly train anymore and you can't possibly eat any less. Now, now you're fucked because where do you go from there? It's like, uh, it's just adding more stresses, right? Yeah. Obviously, you know, training, keep increasing training is more stress. Keep it, you know, incre uh, decreasing food is more stress. Yeah. So when you look at this, like what, what uh, emphasis do you put on like meditation or anything like that? Uh, you know what? We put a high, uh, we've a massive, a massive inf uh, emphasis on this, but it's the stuff people don't want to do. Yeah. Like if you tell somebody, look, look at the easiest thing they can do. I need you to go get a massage this week. I don't have time for that. No, what you're telling me is you're not going to make time for it. So what we have to do is if, if somebody's training with me five days a week, I'm going to go, all right, you're training now four days a week and you're going to spend that other hour. You're going to go get a rub and tuck or whatever you want to do, get in a float tank or whatever, whatever infrared spawn, whatever does it right. And, and yeah, I'm going to lose a little bit of money, but I'm doing the right thing, right? Because I have to show them and I have to come up with strategies of how they can do 
more when I'm not around there to, to basically wipe their ass. Yeah. It's like sleep. No one has time to sleep. Okay. I tell you what. So for the next week, I'd like you to go to bed five minutes earlier. When you nail that, then we'll talk. Once they nail that, okay. How hard was that? I was actually pretty easy. Can you go to bed five minutes earlier this week? And you just do little things like this over time, but you can only do that if you're focusing on the long game. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, and talking about the transformations, if you look back, if you look back at like the early nineties, right, where did all these transformations come from? Because when I got in the industry, you didn't see them yeah. and they came in when Bill Phillips started EAS and they started giving money, $50,000 body for life came out with a book and he's, he was using that to funnel EAS supplement sales and selling myoplex and things like that. So that's kind of where it got adopted. Cause you didn't really see that before people would go into a trainer because they felt like shit and they, they, I want to learn how to exercise properly. I want to do this. And the industry was very different then. Um, then EAS started and now everybody's like, we had, it's a 12 week challenge, 12 week challenge. Where, where did that 12 weeks come from? It came from the bodybuilding world, you know, 12 week uh, pre-contest, 16 week pre-contest. Then it became, okay, let's, let's do eight week challenges. Mm-hmm. All right. Then they get, got down to the 28 day challenge. And I don't have a problem with any of these things. As long as that client understands that this is a short term thing. So yeah. I'm going to, that, that first three to four weeks is crucial for a lot of people mm-hmm. that you need to see a lot of results there to keep them motivated. Yeah. But they also need to understand that, look, we're going to do this to give you a jump start, And then we're going to kind of slow it down a little bit. And then we're going to chip away at it for the other, uh, the year. If coaches would start thinking more long-term, they keep clients long-term mm-hmm. instead of just being a transformation mill where somebody trains with you for 12 weeks and now they're gone. Now you're, now you need to market more because you have, you're constantly having to get new clients. I'd rather keep a client for five or six years, teach them everything they need to know. And then be like, Hey, if you want to train, we can keep training. Or if you don't, then fuck off. Yeah. But I'm always thinking about that long-term plan and, and there's always new things that we can get with our clients. Their goals right now might change in the next 18 months. We've always got other goals we can head to, right? It's so crucial, man. Like, I think, like, you know, IBT, we do 28 day challenges, but I think the people had people um, or coaches in the industry sort of have a dig at me about a 28 day challenge yeah. because they don't understand what happens on day one of the 28 day challenge yeah. because they've never done it. So, like, on day one, when people come into an IBT, we have a seminar on literally on day one. And I say, hey guys, like, you signed up for a 28 day challenge, but, you know, we chuck everyone up on an in body scanner. And so those people would say, in body is a shit. Well, in body is an in body and it's our, you know, norm. Yeah. And they do an in body every, every single week. So it's like, okay, cool. You're 35% right now. Um, now, guys, like, you know, for everyone in here who Wants, wants abs and it's like yeah it's like okay that's somewhere between like nine to twelve percent so you have like twenty percent body fat to lose no one's losing twenty percent body fat yeah. in 28 days so with this guys we're gonna lose about half a percent of body fat every week on average and this uh, this is over a long period of time so who here has over 20 weeks and everyone puts their hand out it's like fantastic so this isn't any more a 28 day challenge you lose five kilos this is a 20 week challenge to start to kickstart your transformation for the rest of your life yeah and like that is day one and on day one for us like we literally tell them it's like you have up to day 28 to cancel but if you don't cancel up until day 28 we're going on to the next 20 weeks to complete your transformation Mm -hmm. and like they sign that on day one yeah so they understand for them the habits they're trying to build they understand that this is uh, like again we sort of slowly progress them into understanding nutrition so we move towards like a precision nutrition style the style it's like hey guys like you just need us out eating a little bit cleaner essentially like you need to have your piles of protein have your fists of carbs mm. have your thumbs are fat so we sort of start to track them that way and then they can they start to get results and they start to move better because we start to be spring our guys in not heavy lifting but we bring them in to start with not really much barbell work so they're just moving because remember guys like you know as we talked before it's like Susie Muffin top she probably doesn't need to try and squat 100 kilos on yeah. a session she just needs to slightly move more and start to have better habits and track her sleep on a daily basis basis and make sure she's meditating 10 minutes every single day and just give a little bit of time to herself and you know they come in with three times a week to get them moving forward and you know after that then we can start to give them you know better macros or better meal plans and start to increase the strength component because they've actually they move to the threshold it's like okay I've moved now now I can say I'm moving better now I can start lifting heavier now yeah and I'm, it's because I'm further bought in because I've got my results I'm more bought into your process so I'll start 
start to track my food, not just like palms of protein, but oh, that's 150 grams of chicken. Yeah. Um, and that's the RBT process. And I think a lot of people don't see the back end of it. They yeah. don't see the front end marketing of it. But for us, man, like, you know, we, you know, get muscle nerds in on education for us and all our trainers because, and we've done FMA in the past and like we've just got like so many from people have an education team with like Ben Can. Like we place, or I place such an emphasis on education for our coaches yeah. because if they're not educated, like I'm losing. Mm. I'm literally losing the fitness industry battle because because I think for me, that's such a, a crucial thing. Like there is a crazy amount of uneducated trainers hurting people on a daily basis. So even if people come into RBT and work for us, uh, hopefully, and they leave, hopefully I've given them enough education. So then I can empower them <coughs> to go and help more people when yeah. they leave RBT. And I think, okay, cool. I won today. I won, even though like, you know, I've paid for them to get that education. Do you think that is one of the biggest problems with our industry at the moment people do not put enough emphasis on education it's a little bit better in australia and it's a little bit better in london and in the uk than it is anywhere else right so those are our two biggest markets like yeah. when we go to america and we go to canada it's not a big market for us it's becoming one now but like if i if i started teaching trx and bosu ball classes i'd i'd kill it i'd kill it in the united states because that's a, they for whatever reason the americans have a real aversion to science yeah. right now you you have guys like you've got you know brad schoenfeld and you've got james krieger and you've got all these guys and they're trying to change that right but it's it's slow going yeah. you know and um but i think you know usually usually countries tend to follow America. But at this point, I think America and Canada, all of North America is kind of following London and following Australia in this too. But that's why like the people that I know making the best money, getting the best results are here in Australia yeah. and also in the UK. Right. But like we said on the 28 day challenge, you're pre framing the narrative. You're telling them like, okay, we're doing this challenge to get you a head start, yeah. but you understand that what you're wanting is impossible in four weeks. Yeah. This is a, this is a long-term thing. That's how it should be done. And people, people think that I'm opposed to transformations. Yeah. I'm not opposed to transformations. I'm opposed to not pre-qualifying people for transformations. Yeah. And what you're doing, putting them in that 28 day challenge, you're pre-qualifying them. And you're also telling them like, I'm going to tell you how this is going to go. We're going to get you as far as we can in 28 days. But you understand like you're going to need five or six more months yeah. to polish this off. And then you're probably going to want to stay because you're going to chase new stuff. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what we do. Like our average members think it's about 13 months across like the gym. So, yeah. you know, 3000 members of 13 months is pretty good for us. Yeah, hundred um, percent. So I, I guess for us, you know, one education is crucial, but then I think it's for us when people come in, it's also changing their standards. I think people don't look at the standards that they are having in their life. Like I think, yeah, like I just want to eat new food. I just want to, um, I have to eat healthier. And it's like, okay, what are your current standards around eating? Yeah. Like, what do you mean? Well, if you have no standards, they are your standards. And it's like, if you just eat whatever the fuck you want, whenever the fuck you want, if you just order pizza every fucking weekend, like you literally have no standards standards anymore yes yeah. like your standards could be i'm going to eat 24 meals that are in line with my uh, my nutrition plan each week okay? yeah that's my standard now my standard is i'm gonna sleep seven hours a night what was your standards before i have fucking, fucking no standards okay yeah well, that's a new standard yeah you have now so it's like the standards are the things that actually create the transformation as coaches we're just trying to give standards to our clients that they can uphold and not fail with yeah because like you said earlier, like if you give unrealistic standards or expectations to clients, it's like, you know, walk, you know, 12,500, 15,000 steps a day and sleep, you know, don't worry about fuck, fuck sleep. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> so get up and fucking train. Um, like if we, you know, train seven days a week, you try and give these standards to clients that literally their previous standards were like never training, walking 3,000 steps or 2,000 steps a day because it offers, that's normal though. Like yeah. Normally, like people, like a lot of people won't be walking over 3,000 steps a day. Like that is like society. Yeah. You know, especially in Melbourne or even like, you know, like, like not in Melbourne, at least they get on fucking trams here and they walk to their work a lot of the time. You know, so many people, it's like their cars in their basement or their garage, they walk to their garage, they drive to their office, they get out of their car, they sit at their desk, they walk back to their car, they drive back home and that's their fucking walking. That's it. It's probably a thousand steps. Um, so it's like trying to go from someone from a thousand to 12 and a half thousand is fucking crazy so, and then you create anxiety around not getting all your walking in yeah. like 
here's, here's the th- I'm always looking for things that give you a better return on investment, right? So if we go back to that kind of hashtag fuck cardio group, um, if, if I'm, they're like, okay, fuck cardio, but I want you to walk 15,000 steps a day. I mean, fuck, are you fucking serious? Like you're just, you're just chasing calories anyway. So why don't we give you something that gives you better adaptation? It takes less time. If I put somebody on 15,000 steps a day, that's like 12 kilometers in walking. Okay. That's going to take you, that's going to take you all of, you know, two and a half hours or longer. I could do the same thing on a treadmill in like an hour, hour and 10 minutes, like, and get them more fit and tell them push it. And I'm still getting the output that I need. I mean, why don't, why don't I just do that? If they even need it, yeah. you know, when, when you look into the research, the lowest effective dose for walking seems, seems to be around 7,200 steps a day. If they can hit 7,200 steps a day, I'm pretty happy. If they can do more than that, I'm probably going to give them maybe a stretching routine or go do some yoga or go do a massage or, you know, do some animal flow or maybe do some cardio or maybe lift another session. I'm just going to give them more stuff that's going to cause the adaptations that's going to drive them to become a better athlete or a better client. Like, I, I guess that's the biggest thing for us all, right? It's like, you know, what is the least amount you can do to get the maximal result? Right. And, and once you hit that threshold, like, okay, add something else in. Yeah. Um, that's not going to add more stress or more time because time is obviously stress. Yeah. Um, so it's like, oh, I can't do an hour and a half, so I may as well do nothing. Yeah. And that's like what a lot of people do. Oh, I can't feed my, you know, 12 kilometer, you know, 12,000 steps, so I may as well not even walk today. Yeah. I can't eat my meal plan, so fuck that. I may as well have a pizza and 17 ice cream. Yeah. Um, that's, that's who you're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. Right yeah. Um, but if you look at that, those steps, I mean, if I'm going to give somebody 14,000 steps and I'm saying, okay, that's something like nine fucking hours of walking a week right now. Okay. Why don't I just do a little bit of cardio or a little bit of extra weight training and I can cut that down to 30% of that time. Time is one of those things. Times, time's the most valuable commodity you have. You can't, you, it's the one thing you can't pay for. Right. So you can't pay for extra time to spend with your kids. You can't pay for extra time to sleep. You can't buy sleep back. You can't pay for extra time to spend with your partner and save your fucking marriage. Like those are the things that you're not going to be able to pay for and get back when you're doing stupid fucking methods that don't really make sense. And you start majoring in the minors, pick stuff that's going to have a better return on investment. that takes less time. Use the 80, 20 rule. You know, what's that 20% of the stuff you can do. That's going to give you the 80% of the effort instead of doing a hundred percent of the dumb shit. It's going to give you fucking what? 5% payback yeah exactly mm. i guess you know we talk about a lot of uh um, we're looking at polygon stuff lean legs okay so tell me what are your thoughts on how, to, how a female should lean out of her legs i'll tell you the a here, here's here's the thing <clears throat> people are a lot fatter than they think they are yeah. especially coaches yep. i get coaches all the time they come to me they go you know what i think if i lose five kilos i'll be shredded and I'm looking at their pictures. I'm like, bro, you, you're going to have to lose like 20 to 25 kilos. No fucking way. Yeah. So they lose the first five kilos and they're like, I'm not shredded yet. Brother, I told you, you're about 20 kilos away from being shredded. Okay. It's just going to take five more kilos. They lose another five kilos. I'm not shredded yet. You, you got another 10 kilos to lose. Like people don't understand that. So when you look at women and they're like, I just can't get my legs lean. You just need, you're going to have to keep a, hey, you're going to have to keep pushing. Like yeah. that's part of the problem. Like the way men and women store body fat is different. When you have somebody who's got a gynoid, uh, a lower body predisposition for a holding on the fat, which women do, that's going to be the last thing that goes on some people. Mm-hmm. For men, it's usually going to be their guts and their lower back, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're not as lean as you need to be, you probably just need, you haven't dieted down long enough, yeah. right? So mm-hmm. yeah. And if you've been dieting for a long time, now it's time for a diet break, stabilize your weight, and then let's make another effort. There are some tactics that I found work really well. So something I learned from Joel Jameson at eightweeksout.com is a high uh, HICT training, which is high intensity continuous training. What I when you do this protocol, my favorite protocol, especially for women, is to get on a spin bike and we crank the intensity up until you can only do 20 to 30 revolutions per minute, and you just grind that out for like start with 10 minutes, work your way up to 15, work your way up to 20. Do that as a separate conditioning session or put it at the end of your leg day, and I found that works really well. It teaches the fast twitch fibers how to oxidate better, so you can start burning through fat and carbohydrates more effectively. Yep. So you look at at um, localized conditioning in the legs, and they actually did a study. I 
think Brad Schoenfeld posted it where they had one group that only lifted uh, their lower body and one group that only lifted their upper body. The lower body group lost primarily fat from the lower body and the upper body group lost primarily fat from their upper body. Yeah. Right. So there is this spot reduction. Eh, we, I don't think we can really say that, but I mean, we're seeing more and more that the way you structure the training will dictate where you move fuel substrates. Yeah. So if somebody wants to lose more lower body fat, maybe they're doing three lower body workouts a week. Maybe they're only doing one upper body workout a week. If it's vice versa, maybe we do it the other way. And I remember, uh, years and probably 20 years ago, I was, uh, my first personal training certification was with the ISSA and Tom Platts was one of the lecturers and he was, it was, uh, Fred Hatfield and Tom Platts and all that. And I sat in on a seminar with Tom Platts and he was saying at the time, he goes, he goes, think, he goes, we can't really prove this yet, but think about this. Look at office workers, right? If you sit on your ass all day, guess what happens to your ass? You end up putting fat on your ass, right? And he started talking about that. And, and I don't know, like this is totally unscientific, right? But it, it, it just makes sense when you start looking at, at, at anecdotal evidence, right? He was talking about looking at people that have a really poor gut and they hold a lot of fat on their gut. If you do crunches, is it going to spot reduce? No. If you do a lot of glute work, is it going to spot reduce? No. But if you look at people sitting down, putting a lot of fat on their ass or people have poor cores going to have more fat on their stomach. Does it make sense that maybe if we started getting more blood flow and start actually training these areas, it would facilitate losing fat from those areas much more efficiently. And I found that that seems to be the case with some exercises. I don't, I don't normally like to talk about this on podcasts because people are going to hear this and go, Oh, Luke's pulling shit out of his ass. And you're right. I am pulling shit out of my ass right now, but you know, there's stuff that has not been shown in research to work yet, or it's simply not been studied. All right. Who's going to, who's going to fund a study on, you know, like Brett Contreras doing fucking, uh, supine hip extensions. And uh, who's going to take the skin folds on your ass and see if your ass fat's going down because you're doing that specific training. Nobody, but it doesn't hurt. Let's just fucking try it and see if it works. And that's a lot of what it is. Like we've got research and we've got anecdotal experience and somewhere in the middle lies the truth. So if we know something, Thing works fuck it we can't really say like i can say this is my opinion but i also have to say research doesn't back me up on this yeah. but try it maybe it works i don't know yeah so i've gone i've gone from when i was a polycon group is just like saying how things work and having massive cognitive dissonance because research says i'm full of shit but then there on the other side you have stuff like experience shows me that this works but it's not really i can't prove it as fact but i have observed that this works there's nothing wrong with saying that as long say it's your opinion and not evidence-based yeah no, most definitely. so with this man like i guess the biggest thing is like what are your thoughts on nasal strips <sighs> oh god i remember when nasal strips first came out yeah. back in the 90s everybody was wearing them you yeah. Emma Smith was wearing them. You see Deion Sanders was wearing them. They had Nike strips and things like that. And it, it got to be a really big thing. Um, and then in the late nineties, around 98, a bunch of studies came out saying, look, works really great. If you're snoring, if you're, if you're decongested, that with a decongestant works really well. And basically said, it's fuck all for performance. Yep. If, if you wear no strips and you feel like you're getting some type of, if there's some type of placebo effect, yep. cool, but it's not going to be magic. And I'll tell you what, what's not marketable is the, 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 uh, airflow devices that actually have been shown to work really well, which are baskets that go in your nose and open your nose up. Like no one's going to market that for source farms where you got fucking baskets opening your nose. Like I think, um, if you really want to get more flow through, just get you a big old drill bit and drill through your fucking nostrils so that you reduce airflow or just cut your fucking nose off. Yeah. Cut your nose off and then get like a funnel and then ram air it in there. Right. Hey, look, that's the thing. It, it goes back to ex experience versus research. Research says it does nothing. If you feel inherently that it does, like I've got a friend that is high on the fucking nose strips. If you put those on and you feel like they're working really well, knock yourself out They're They don't cost their cheap. Yeah. So why not? But uh, I'd rather just spend my money on shit that actually is going to work. 
What do you reckon about the uh, the entitlement in the fitness industry at the moment? Entitlement to uh, make you know go online. We talked about that earlier. Yeah. Entitlement to make like oh, I'm, a, I'm a personal trainer. I should make a hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Like what do you think about that? They're full of shit. Like here's the thing, man. When I got in the industry, you did you didn't make shit. When I got in the industry, it was a very taboo thing. Like even uh, when I when I wanted my first personal training certification, it was kind of a joke to be a personal trainer back then. Right? Nobody did it, and I asked my parents for six hundred dollars. Uh, can I borrow six hundred bucks? I'll pay you back. I want to do personal training certification. And, and my mother looked at me and laughed and says, "This, you you can go ahead and do this. You know, while you're in between college or whatever." He goes, "This will never become a career for you. This is just a hobby." And back then, she was probably right. And you know, nowadays, it's totally different. But back then, you would you would find a mentor and you would do an apprenticeship and a mentorship and you would study your fucking ass off and you would you would work hard knowing that yeah i'm probably going to make thirty five thousand dollars a year for a really long time but now people can come into the industry making six figures and they don't know shit mm-hmm. and they're not they're not striving to learn more shit and they're going they they bypass the whole let me learn about how the body works let me learn rural programming let me learn how nutrition works i'm just going to give people stock templates off of bodybuilding.com and i'm going to charge a hundred dollars an hour and i'm just going to jump in the shit and I'm going to, I'm going to make six figures. I'm going to learn how to sell and market and all this sales and marketing are inherently massively important yeah. to what you do. Once you know what the fuck you're doing, but you, there's too many people doing sales and marketing <coughs> that don't know how to get results. And so what they, they end up becoming a, a lead generation. They're not a personal trainer. They're a lead generation specialist. So they know they can write really good sales copy. They can sell really well, but they can't produce results. So they just, they just work on numbers, yeah. numbers. They know if they market enough that they can build a career without ever having done anything good in the industry. And, and that's, it's backwards. I completely agree. I think like when anyone ever comes to me for coaching, I say this all the time, like a couple of people I've told, told like out of integrity, I literally can't coach you. I need you to go back to step one and, and yeah. actually learn how to be a good coach. Um, but I tell them like, if you aren't getting transformations yet, go get transformations. They're like, oh, but I'm just getting into the industry. What should I do? I'm like, oh, go for work for someone. Yeah. Like, hey, you're just getting into the industry. Like yeah. go work for someone right now until you get transformations or put your hand up and say, I've got no transformations. Can someone, and I'm, and I'm getting my hair around to like this fitness thing. And I've got a good idea of nutrition and training. Can I train like 20 people for free for the next like yeah. you know, 24 weeks? And let me train you for free for 24 weeks and go get a job somewhere else whilst you're getting these transformations and you can fuck up on these people that aren't really paying you and you're trying to help them transform their life you're helping them get healthy and then once you've done that like oh cool I understand how to do this now and now I can actually um, out of integrity get paid for it yeah. because like I feel, I feel like there's a lack of integrity when people are coming to you know go hey pay me $100 a session that's like okay well you know what, where's this program come from yeah. or like are you giving any type of nutrition or are you talking to them about what's happening outside of this one session that you're pretending to take them through at the moment i think there's this entitlement that people go through their certificates and when i was in canada living i was like teaching canfit pro like there's like three day course to become a fucking personal trainer and in australia it's like just do it online and you can outsource it on like upwork for someone else to do all your answers yeah and then all of a sudden like you didn't even do anything to do this course and now you're a fucking certified trainer and we're looking after people's bodies and their lives essentially I feel, and then they're coming out of this going, I now deserve to make $100,000 a year. I think there's, I think we're in a backwards industry at the moment. Oh, yeah. Um, And I think it will change. It it needs to change. And usually people get weeded out, but I think we're in this, uh, we're we're in a uh, kind of in the age of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know the word I'm looking for mass something mass effect mass whatever but we're getting this but this crescendo where people are starting to realize that there's a lot of people out there that don't know what the fuck they're talking about and it's going to be at the point where people start getting people are getting called out right now for shit like that left and right for saying stupid things and doing stupid things and all that and there's going to be an effect where you're going to f- the, the governments are going to start cracking down on this stuff and you're going to be fucked yeah. like especially personal trainers who are giving you're you're allowed to give basic 
basic nutritional advice. Yeah. Most trainers aren't allowed to write meal plans, right? And if you want to do that, you have to go through the right channels and get the right accreditation and then get the insurance and things like that. Um, because, you know, we have the power to drive people's physiology in a positive manner. We also have the, the power to really fuck people up. And that's what's happening right now. And, you know, last year there was a couple of people that died. Uh, there was a Motai girl that died. There was another bodybuilder that died. Um, and nutrition and training can be very powerful. It can also fuck people up really, really hardcore. And, and you're seeing a lot of that right now. So, um, it's, it's, they, they, they think that it's supposed to be an easy job. This is not an easy job, right? You need to go get education. You need to do your apprenticeships and learn how this is going. And if you don't know how to do it, find somebody that you can work with. I have six guys that mentor under me. We get on the, each of us get on the phone for three hours a, a month. And I go over case studies. I also go through our material to teach them to make sure they know what they're doing. That way they can speak from a level of authority, but then they can also, when they're writing a program, they know the consequence and they know the predictability of how long this is going to take, how it's going to work, and all the all the physiological systems and how this stuff works. So then they can make more educated decisions on how to how to manipulate the program to get the right results and keep people safe and healthy. Because there's a difference between writing a program and knowing why you're writing the program. Hundred percent. If you can't lay out a program and go. I dotted this I because of this. I crossed this T because of this. You have, you don't know what you're doing. You're just throwing shit at the wall and you're hoping something sticks. And we've all done it. Like I, 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 I be, I, I'm a hypocrite. I did it for a long time. And then I woke up one day and I went, man, I got to stop doing this, man. For six years, me in the industry, yeah. I was just like, <laughs> well, I did that the first 15 years. And I was like, oh, fuck, maybe, you know, I'm getting paid too much. And I'm actually being a dickhead right now. Yeah. And I'm like, I was getting transformations, but I was like, if they weren't getting results, it's like, cool, you're not following the fucking advice. It's clearly like, your fault, not fault, mine. Right? Yeah. And then oh. I wouldn't take ownership, and that's who I was, right? Yeah. I'd be like, you need to train harder, you need to eat a little bit less. And I was that guy, right? And yeah. I was, like, I was like, okay, maybe, you know, I need to look at, maybe they could have been fucking up, and I need to look at their mindset more. So I need to look at, okay, what's holding them back as far as like, you know, do they have, um, bad uh, like their habits are around food because of you know them growing up or yeah. habits around foods because their environment they're putting themselves in I didn't even look at it as far as like okay let's change your environment on where you're eating or even like when you're looking at creating habits like the cue that's making them want that reward of you know going out and going to the movies and smashing Maltese and fucking two chop tops yeah. it's like okay cool what, what's the what's the response what's that, that uh, need that you want at the end of it and it's like how about we just manipulate that and get you can give you go get a rub and tug instead yeah you're probably just trying to get some connection and feel some yeah. happiness and it's like you probably feel better it, um but i wasn't looking at that at all i was just like trying fucking harder eat fucking less hey you gotta look at you gotta look at those triggers of why people are self-sabotaging something I, I picked up from eric helms a few months ago was he was talking about with with nutritional programming he doesn't he just wants to track at first he goes i don't care what you eat yeah. but I, you got to track everything like i need to see every single thing that you're putting in your mouth right so i'm not going to tell you what macros what calories but we're going to do this for a couple of weeks and we're going to see what patterns and he would see patterns of Oh, okay, this guy's eating like three donuts every Tuesday at whatever. So we need we need to talk about this. And that the guy works in an office. It's fucking Donut Tuesday. He thinks he's only eating one. He's now understanding. Wow, I'm eating three yeah. instead of one. Okay, what what is the trigger surrounding that habit that's causing that? Now we can eliminate that trigger so that you only eat one donut instead of three, or maybe we eventually eliminate the donut. But that comes down to the art of coaching, doesn't it? Of, you know, I can give somebody the best the numbers, and I can give them. The best advice, but I can't be there forcing them to do the right thing. And in a lot of cases, people are using pain avoidance because of some type of trauma or stress. I need to get down to that, that level of why they're feeling the need to self-medicate. Okay. Now that we understand that they're cognizant that they're doing it. Now they see what that trigger is. Now let's see if we can either eliminate or manage the trigger or the trigger response. Cause most people are moving through this and have these unconscious triggers that you have to bring up consciously. Yeah. So then they can go, Oh cool. I didn't even know I was fucking doing this. Yeah. 
Um, like whether it be on a Friday night that you have a bottle of wine, you didn't realize you had a bottle of wine, you thought you were having a glass of wine, or it be, you know, you're having an argument with uh, your boss yeah. every Wednesday when you have a fucking management meeting. Yeah. And then you miss the training and then it like becomes this like sabotaging effect after it all. It could be like every time you go to the movies, like whenever I go to the movies, like when, like I think Tony Robbins talks about it's like these human needs, there's like significance, connection, variety, growth, comp- contribution, and certainty. When something hits or what three triggers like all of a sudden we create this like this habit that we have to keep doing yeah. so if I go to the movies and I'm seeing a new movie well it gives me variety if I'm going with a friend um, I'm giving getting connection right so I'll go to my partner and I know if I eat shit like a Maltese is an ice cream whatever the fuck you want it's giving me certainty I'm certain that I'm going to feel good at the end of mm-hmm. this so now I've got this trigger that I have these I have to have this habit in my life and keep replicating this habit because it makes me feel good I have these three of these human needs and if I take the, the food out well I don't have the certainty anymore that I'm going to feel good so it's like I need to eat the food so it's like okay cool what else can you add in there that's going to give you the certainty like what else is going to give you maybe it's going to give you uh, growth or um, contribution instead maybe yeah. watch a fucking documentary um, yeah. or something instead yeah. of movies like I love the movies like but like for me I had these subconscious patterns that I wasn't even realizing what I was doing until I consciously became where I was like fuck okay well why why am I doing that I think you know one thing I know you tell a lot of people to do and I actually tell a lot of people to do is journaling yeah uh, people don't actually write down their thoughts or journal on anything anymore. And I think if people can ask themselves a question, and this is what I do, I tell them, just write a question and then just, just there's no right or wrong to the answer. Just write a page, write for 15 minutes, write for 20 minutes, yeah. write for 10 minutes, write for fucking two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Just write. Uh, it's like, why do I eat ice cream and chocolate on Friday nights? Like, just fucking write an answer. Yeah. Like, you just, you might, that, that subconscious pattern that might come out. That's like, why? Well, um, because I could be feeling like this. So what's it? Why is it? Why do I need to feel like that? And if you just start journaling each day and become this habit, all of a sudden you probably unlock all the fucking shit that's holding you back anyway. Yeah. And, and, and as, as coaches, like we're we're really good at doing this for ourselves, but we're really we're, we're really not good at telling other people how to do this. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, I've got a trick. I, I I've never had a. I'm not a sweets guy. I've never had a food addiction. Or anything. My, my thing is wine. And when I start getting stressed out, the thinking part of my brain shuts down and I trigger back in old habits of drinking a bottle or two of wine at night to self-medicate. Then I get shitty sleep. The next day I have to take stimulants to get up. I'm smashing coffee just to get through the day. And I get locked into that pattern. Now that I'm cognizant of that's what happens, I need to say, okay, I need to avoid that trigger or I need to do something to that, take that, take that habit and I need to take that habit and push that energy into something else. So for me lately is my Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Like I know if I go and do a class Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, that eliminates my triggers. So the more active I am, the less likely I am to go do this because I use that as my stress output. Right. But we've got to get better at teaching our clients of, okay, if you, if you have this pattern, if you're doing this every Friday night, every day, what's going on Friday that then triggers this behavior. Now, like you said, write it down. Why do I feel the need to drink a bottle of wine? And I, uh, I feel lonely or I'm stressed out or oh, the shit hit the fan during the day. Okay. I know that's going to come every Friday because it's a pattern. Okay. Now maybe I go and maybe I go do a workout that afternoon, or maybe I go, f- I go for run as hard as I can until I make myself sick. So then I, I don't want to have, I put all of that focus into that run or just something else. Cause I, I've also heard the, the saying that you can't actually, you can't actually get rid of a habit. You can only change a bad habit into something else. So if I focus that bad trigger habit into something else, if I go do jujitsu, if I go to open mat and I fucking thrash myself from five to seven on a Friday night, when I get home, you don't want to fuck, fuck no, <laughs> I, you know what I want? I want a big thing of water. I just want to go to bed. Right. But it's, it's easy for us to talk about that. Cause we know this stuff. But we have to get better to educate our clients of that you need to realize what the triggers are. You also need to look at if you want to change the identity of who you are, you've got to work on your va- value system, your belief system. Like, what is it? Who are you? Like, because if you want to become this new person, you can't continue to identify with the old person. Yeah. So if you grew up and you were the, the token fat kid, right? And that's what's holding you back. You need to sit down and say, okay, let me write, let me take this piece of paper and I'm going to write down who I identify with, what my belief and value systems are about myself, how that modifies my behavior, what skills I need to develop to change that 
that and then I need to put myself in the right environment, mm -hmm. right? So, okay, this is what's going on now. My environment is I'm not going to the gym. My environment is I don't keep enough good food at home and I keep bad food at home. Okay, my behavior plays on that because I don't know how to train or I don't know how to eat and I also don't have a gym membership and I don't have good food in my house, okay? Why is this happening? I need to look over here and write down who I want to become. What are my values and beliefs around that? Like we had a good discussion in a London seminar. We talked about, about fathers, right? And this is the pattern you'll see with highly successful OCD type A driven fathers is they equate being a good father with providing for their family. So they'll kill themselves working 80 hours a week and they never see their kids. Well, you're now, you're a, you want to be a good father. Your kids are, are, are a value to you and you being a good father is a value to you, but you're actually being a provider, not a father. So maybe we start thinking about, well, if I want to be a good father and that's what I want to identify with, I've got to change my value system that surrounds that. Now that I'm going to look at my behaviors, does the audio match the video? Okay. I need to go get my ass in the gym, get my ass a trainer, get my ass a nutritionist. I need to keep good food in my house and never have bad food in my house. And I need to become that new person. Yeah. Right. It's, it's interesting. Like I think one of my favorite books is, um, Maxwell Maltz, psycho cybernetics. Have you read mm, that? No, I haven't. I haven't read it yet. Yeah. He talks about like, he was, a. um, I think he was a psychologist at the start, but he was also a plastic surgeon like back early 1900s. Um, and what he was looking at is, you know, people wanted to change their aesthetics because they wanted to feel better about themselves. And then he did the plastic surgery and then they never felt good about themselves because yeah. they're trying to change their identity, but they didn't cha change their physical appearance, but they never changed their identity. Yeah. So they still identified as the person with the disfigured face or whatever it was. So we're actually, I'm pretty sure he stopped, you know, I last time I read it was like three or four years ago, he stopped doing the plastic surgery and started looking at the mind and how can you change your actual identity? It's a pretty fucking heavy book to read. Yeah. Um, but um, like for me, it's like, cool, it's all about someone's identity. And I think that's when uh, most of me, when we're looking at business, like one of my mates I was coaching for, he has a, um, he builds uh, pergolas and decks and stuff like that, right? He's on the tools. So he identified himself as a laborer because he was a laborer and then his business grew and then he stopped doing the laboring and he started focusing on the business he had people on the tools for him and then he started to like fuck himself up like take drugs and all the rest of it because he he lost his identity yeah he literally lost his identity so then he just started sabotaging fucking everything until he got back to the tools um, so yeah like literally sabotaged his business all the way back to the tools so I think like when we look at this like you know for us if we aren't aware of you know who we identify you know, as and you know what that means to us, then we can never shift it either. Yeah. Um, you know, like as a man thinketh, another early 19, um, 1900s book. So it's like what you think is is who you are. Yeah. So I think you know so many of us, you know, are, like I know you guys have a whole seminar so about food. Yeah. I don't know if does it go into any of this sort of stuff. This is this is exactly what it goes okay. into. It, go, <laughs> it goes into we do so we bring in a counselor from a New. Zealand, who's a, she's a trauma counselor, and it's yeah. all about the psychology of self sabotage. When someone's trying to train right and they're eating right and all that, what's the what's the stop gap? What's the break that's keeping them from moving forward? Why do they continue? They they see good results for three weeks and they go off the rails for three weeks. Why do they get locked into this? And a lot of it, it's a lot of identity politics and it's a lot of early childhood traumas or adolescent traumas and things like that that's going to keep you back. Like in 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 our industry, in the training industry, it's all it's always every single time I ask a coach this, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. So they start building a business and they sabotage the business or they start to lean, get lean and they start to get strong and then they sabotage it because maybe somebody said something when they were a kid that made them feel worthless, right? And you see this with a lot of, of clients that come in that they think that getting a set of abs, that's what's missing from their life. It's gonna make them happy. That's going to make Then they get it and they're like, man, the this sucks to maintain and I'm still miserable. Yeah. Okay, you haven't actually changed the, the problem. And when you look at when you look at things like physiology and biochemistry, if we look at all the things that people present with that, that they're coming to us with, like maybe they have high blood pressure, maybe they have high fasting blood sugar, maybe they're type two diabetic, maybe they've got, they've got all of these issues that are going on. If we start chasing those in things and we don't, we don't work on the cause of all that, which is going to be some, some type of dysregulation of the brain and the hypothalamus, we need to work there and then let everything trickle down. If it's some type of unresolved trauma that's causing transcriptional response issues, well, we need to work 
work on that first. So what we teach in that course is how do you recognize this is happening? And then how do you stay within scope of practice? So you, you know, you know, goddamn good and well, your clients will tell you shit. They won't tell <laughs> anybody else. And you're sitting there thinking, fuck, I just want this. I just want this bitch to fucking deadlift. Like, and they're telling you everything that's going on in their life. Those are red flags. This person's in pain. Yeah. And how do people avoid pain through addiction, whether that's over exercise addiction, food addiction, booze, drugs, hookers, whatever the fuck your addiction is. Um, you're never going to elicit long lasting change until you re until you recognize that they're going through this and until you get them to recognize that. And then you get them to the right help, which is let's get you to somebody qualified to talk to you about this. Cause I'm not that I'm an exercise and sports nutrition specialist. Uh, I'm a metabolic issue specialist. I'm not, I don't know anything about counseling, but I do know someone who could help you. This person's helped me in the past. Let me get you a referral. Let's give her a call right now and see if, see if you can book in and get some, get some talk done. Cause I think it's like it's trying to stay within your wheelhouse whilst still giving them tips to try to in increase their quality of life 100 percent. Right? like so if you can tell them hey just start journaling or hey just have some meditation hey like book in your days with gratitude at the start and gratitude at the end so you're actually a happier motherfucker yeah um, like you give them these tips and then you like nothing's working it's like yeah, you need to see someone yeah because you've got shit that like my tips are going to help you overcome right so like you literally need to deal with this otherwise Ways we're never going to transform your body and it's the same thing as like transforming someone's business i'll like the same advice that i give to people like we'll grow them a million dollar business and other people they'll be like broke as fuck and yeah. it's like okay well it's not the advice that's actually making you broke as fuck it's like you so the advice is solid because it worked for these people over here yeah right but it's not working for you because you might self-sabotage or anything like that like tony robbins talks about state story strategy um so like when we're looking at all this right like um we have when we're looking at body transformations we have these strategies and you're talking about you have all the fucking strategies mm. least mode beast mode right but essentially like you know as knowing then when to apply these strategies yeah. because like for you i know man like you know you aren't a keto advocate but there's times where you give someone keto yeah there's times where you go someone low carb there's times where you go someone fucking high carb i'm sure there's times when you get someone to go fucking vegetarian or something like that absolutely time. Like, yeah so you know there is time but that's the strategies right if you have someone with a fucked up story like i'm not good enough i can't lose weight like you know and they have all these negative self thoughts then they'll never fucking implement the strategy properly either never because they'll self-sabotage along the way um or if someone's in a negative state like positive people negative people like you know i was saying in the car when we sort of caught out like i was pretty negative i was angry in my early 20s um, yeah. like and just like you can you might get lean but then you still have these fucked up stories probably from childhood and then you end up fucking yourself in the long term yeah so it's like for, for yourself it's like you need to be in this like good state this positive state so if you're in like a high vibration positive state on a daily basis and obviously it's not always like possible to be like up here 24 7 um you know you just finished doing seminars for a couple of days and like i would say like you are high state and there has to be a down regulation oh i'm in a down regulate yeah. right now i'm <laughs> fucked but um but yeah but like you're going on you probably you'll probably chill out for a couple of days hopefully no no <laughs> maybe next week, <laughs> next week. <laughs> what I say. um so but like with this it's like you see this high state and you're in this positive state because but you're choosing to do it and i think another good book that i, that I love is victor frankl's a man's search for meaning mm. you read that mm -mm. he talks about um he was in like um concentration camps right people pulled out left right and center from just fucking killed and he's he's that has a couple of great co quotes but it's like you can do anything to me but i essentially choose how i respond yeah um and i think that's the biggest thing so many of us in this world live from external circumstances dictating how we then project back out to the world but if you can own your state on a daily basis and have a high vibration then move across and own your stories mm -hmm. that's an identity shift that you must yeah. have right it's like no i am worthy i am good enough like i am healthy whatever you do that and like the values you surround yourself with that and then if you own these these uh, positive stories instead of negative stories well the strategy actually becomes really easy
Yeah. Because a happy motherfucker with group based stories doesn't sabotage the fuck out of themselves. What's this? We we talk about I mean we talk about that in our foundations course over the weekend. It's like if I say something that offends you, that's your problem, not mine. Yeah. Right? Because that's your reaction to something I said. I triggered something in you, but you're in control of your emotions, not me. Yeah. You can say anything you want to me. I don't give a fuck. Like you can say that I'm full of shit. You can God, fuck you can call me a Jewish bastard. You can call me all this other stuff. I don't really give a shit like because your words don't mean anything to me it takes a it takes a really strong mindset to be able to do that and you'll see that with really highly successful people with high success there's massive highs followed by massive lows and if you're if you're training a lot of successful people you've got to understand like that's what these people go through like people who are massively successful the reason they're successful is because they aren't balanced they're mentally fucking unbalanced and they're either super fucking on or they're super fucking off and like every time I do a seminar, I'm, I'm on. Yeah. And then I go through a massive state of depression for three or four days and I'm pretty much fucking worthless. Yeah, and yeah. I just came back from eight weeks of traveling overseas, teaching seminar for seminar for seminar for seminar. And, uh, when I'm done with these, I'm fucked. Like, yeah. so when you look at your clients, if you're dealing with people like executives or, or people, business owners, you need to understand the, the difference between them and you is that they're so fucking driven. They'll drive their fucking soul into the dirt and then they have to, they have to recover. Yeah. And, but you, you had, it takes a different mindset to train them too, because they need to understand that like, the harder they push themselves, the harder they're going to have to relax, like yeah. play hard, work, uh, work hard, play hard. Yeah. Right. Um, they can't, you can't, train them the same way you train other people because they want to train hard, 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 hard. And they're already like beasting life. At some point they're going to fucking break. Yeah. Do you think it's like a lot of these people, and this is when you'll see someone actually going on a holiday, they take a break and they start losing fat on a holiday rather than, yeah. Hey, I just had, I had like fucking 50 beers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I two weeks off work and all of a sudden I came back 3% leaner. Yeah. What so, yeah. So I'll tell you, I mean, this is, this is the situation I always teach people. If we, if we look at what happens with chronic, chronic stress, somebody who's living in that sympathetic lifestyle, high levels of stress is going to kick up the immune system initially, initially. Now over time, every, the sympathetic system is there to help you. It's a survival mechanism for acute stressors. It's not supposed to be ramped up all the time. So things that are jacked up initially, like your immune system, if that's jacked up chronically, that's going to cause massive levels of inflammation. That's going to start causing all these issues in your body. Your body's going to naturally want to kick up cortisol and other things to, to basically suppress the immune system. So you get people who they haven't had a holiday in five years. They've been building a business. They go on holiday in the first fucking week. They're crook. Like they're sleeping all day. They're sick as shit. And then, yeah, they're going to start self-medicating like crazy. You get a guy that, you know, in, in Texas, we, you know, we all go to Mexico. So you go to Cabo or you go to, uh, uh, Cancun or something like that. And your client will come back. They'll be leaner and I'll be like, fuck, I drink 24 Corona's a day and I eat enchiladas all day. I know what's, this is what needs to happen. You need to write my diet for all Mexican food and beer. <laughs> and you're like, no, 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 no. That's not actually what happened. You actually, your body was actually, you calmed down, you were de-stressed, your immune system kicked on. Now you're recovering and now you're good. Now you can get, now what this tells me is you need to spend more time being serious about your, your relaxation, right? That doesn't give you a license to binge drink 24 beers a day and get lean. No. That gives you a license to, yeah, like we said, journaling and meditation and, you know, take a nice long bath and try to get more sleep and going get a massage and stretching, stretch therapy and stuff like that. That's going to calm you the fuck down. Cause most of these people, all they know is yang. They just yeah. know output. Yeah. They don't understand the concept of the more you yang, the more you have to yin because you have to re you have to replenish that oil that you're burning all the time. Cause people who are highly successful, they'll, they'll burn the, the rope at both ends. And then I'll also set the middle of it on fire as well. Like, it's interesting, right? Like I, I took on, I don't really take on many clients anymore, but um, I took on a client the other, other week and you know, she does like CrossFit and um, I looked at the calories and straight away, like I just bumped her up like 800 calories, didn't touch anything else. And she was struggling losing fat and she lost like 3% in the first yeah. like three and a half, three weeks, right? She was lost a percent a week. And I was like, only one change because she literally wasn't fueling herself enough for the yeah. pain she was having. And all of a sudden, body was like, literally, oh, thank you. Yeah. Like, thank you for giving me some fucking nutrients. If you have a, if you have a chronic mismatch between fuel and performance, yeah. you're, you're going to fuck things up, right? You're going to go into a, what they're calling now 
our relative energy deficiency, right? And that can be, you see this in CrossFit for a lot, like for a CrossFitter, if you tell a CrossFitter, I need you to take tomorrow off, they're like, all right, I'll just do, I'll do, I'll do just a real easy recovery workout. Okay. What are you going to do? I'm going to out and run 20 K. Yeah. It's like, no, that's not what I meant. Like sleep a couple extra hours and get a yeah. massage. And they're like, no, 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 I have to train and they won't eat anything. And then when you try to bump their food up, they freak the fuck out. But some of these guys, even the girls will, will calculate their TDEE and they need like 4,200 calories a day and they're eating 1600. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, if you, if you want to keep going to that next level, we have to bump your food up yeah. and you have to they're they're wanting to maintain that crossfit look that crossfit body and it's like dude you can't get to that next level like what got you yeah what got you to this level is not going to get you to the games and it's certainly not going to make you win the games unless we convince you that you need to fuel for performance so that's kind of my thing now too is we 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 stop talking about fueling for fat loss right we talk about fueling for performance because that changes the thinking that somebody has resolved around that then they're not thinking because if i say we're going to eat for fat loss all they think about is pulling out calories. Yeah. If I talk about eating for performance, they understand if I want to perform better and fat loss is a side effect of that I have to eat for that performance. So it changes their mindset of, of what food is actually doing in your body. Yeah, that's so true. Well, man, like we talking for ages, so um, I think I'll right now. <laughs> um, Luke, where, where for you, man, like I, I've been to your courses. I think they're fucking awesome, man. Like, Thank I, you. I also tell so many people to go to your courses, whether it be the program design online, whether it be a foundations course where there's no doubt the food um whether it's what's what's can we have another course because like uh we've got that we got the mentorships we do like we go to facilities like we're doing stuff for rbt um virgin active we go we basically had you know, do their education for them come in and give talks and yeah. things like that and yeah so we, we've got a lot of a lot of different stuff we've now we've hired a full-time therapist so we're going to start creating like post rehab rehab type stuff and uh, i think we're going to start possibly for people who are qualified actually creating treatment courses as well as long as you have the credentials and the insurance and then get you with Jason and he'll teach you how to like fix people's fucked up the dude and that type of thing. So yeah, we've got a lot of stuff we've got. I'm we're transforming the foundations course more to like a full on sports nutrition course, something that would be like a CISSN prep, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. Something, something where you actually understand how this works and you can like actually go into real sports nutrition and help people get a lot better and a lot stronger and a lot more conditioned and, and get the focus off the transformations and that'll be a side effect of getting bigger and stronger and faster and everything else uh yeah um we've got a lot of shit going on in the next couple of years that we're doing so where people we should find you like where are you going we've got a really awful website that we're always continuously trying to fix which yeah. is muscle nerds.net yeah. we're on instagram at muscle nerds health underscore muscle nerds underscore health you can find us at uh, muscle nerds on facebook but we, we rarely well, know. Should just find you on yeah. facebook and inbox you because you're great again fuck <laughs> fuck you <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at communication. So don't do that. If you want to inquire about any of our stuff, it's info at musclenerds.net and Dell will take care of you. Awesome. Awesome, man. Like as always, um, you know, chatting to you, whether it be, you know, film today yeah. or, you know, whatever. Um, it's cool, man. I will probably do it again. Always good. Awesome, man. I appreciate that. I think I'm